Six yard return and net yardage is what you're looking for and we're getting a penalty call again against the Panthers and that'll be half the distance of the goal line as the ball now is on the 17 yard line and the Panthers of Pittsburgh with nearly the whole quarter to go and down by only seven points if they are to move this football must do it from within the shadow of their own goal line. But they've had to move it the whole distance of the field except for the. The football makes it down to the eight yard line so they got 92 yards to go the last time they moved 80 yards before Hall took it in from the two. 13 33 to go 29 22 Florida State. Dombrowski wide to the left Collier who was hurt a little while ago is inside him and White Collins comes out to the right and now they say time has been called. It's football season again. What can you say the Panthers did everything wrong after the first five minutes of the first half the kicking game and the Panthers own drop football gave the uh, Florida State Seminoles a 23 to 7 lead at the half. But now I look at the scoreboard and it's 29 22 and somebody may be bowing in the direction of Bill Capice with four straight field goals and five altogether. Well his five field goals uh, break the record here. They'll break the record at a lot of schools. Uh, However, Florida State continues to do a great job offensive ball possession. They had the ball seven minutes and 55 seconds in the third quarter, even though they made only six points. Pittsburgh had it 7.05 and scored two touchdowns. All right, Dombrowski is wide, wide left. Out here inside him, and White Collins over here on the inside. Marino, with outstanding protection, throws it out to Benji Pryor, his tight end, who gets out to the 15 yard line, maybe the 16, and down he goes there. Tackle there by James Gilbert and Monk Bonasort. Bonasort is out of Pittsburgh. I think you've heard the story. He played a lot of football with and against some of these men across the line of scrimmage from him, the Pittsburgh Panthers, but found his way down here to Florida State. Marino is 14 of 24, 257 yards, and two touchdowns. McMillan carries the football, and McMillan is on his feet past the 30 yard line, and the Panthers who started on the eight now find themselves out near the 35 yard line with better field position down by only a touchdown and a lot of time to go their about 13 minutes. Their offense has moved the ball beautifully throughout the entire game. It's been Starks kicking and their own turnovers that have kept Florida State in the lead. Now Collier and Collins both go wide left. Joe McCall is in. A touchdown maker of not too long ago, number 34, and the ball is lost. And it belongs over. Ron Hester, the freshman Joe McCall, dropped the football. There's another one of those fumbles, and the ball's at the 28 yard line. You're not supposed to fumble on a handoff if you're hit, well, then yes, you can always say that well, they knocked us loose from the football. This is one that just is mechanical ball handling in the backfield. Marino turns back, a little bit of a misdirection. And the ball is simply bobbled, dropped. Florida State again recovers with fine field position. And Hester reaches out and gathers it in. And now second man through his plat and wow he runs into a stone wall and maybe got about a yard and that is all. The thing that just kills you Jim is when you give him a turnover inside the 35 yard line it's like giving him three points. Hugh Green and Steve Fidel made the stop that's a gain of two at his second down and eight the ball is at the 26 yard line. And Capice is standing on the sidelines while his holder is practicing taking the ball. And there it goes Whiting and he is close to a first down. Mike Whiting. Down to the 18 yard line and if he's gotten past the 18 and I believe he has that's got to be another first down Florida State it is. Good call by Florida State. And excellent blocking. Good daylight solid tackle but the necessary yardage for the first down. Williams goes wide to the right. Unglaw is on the left. High formation stock still in charge. First man through is Whiting the fullback and he's not going too far is he. 
You can see Bajorski, 68, getting up the initial man with him, along with Meisner, number 86. Call it no gain, second down 10. Coaches get redundant talking about how turnovers beat you and field position beats you. Florida State has had no turnovers. Pittsburgh has had five. Mike Whiting has carried for 47 yards, and Sam Platt, the tailback, well over 100 yards against this outstanding Pittsburgh defense. Second down and 10 to go. And there goes Whiting inside the 15-yard line. It'll be third down and a long five, perhaps six yards after they spot the ball. And Pittsburgh continues to blitz, which takes away from their pursuit, but it also scares Florida State if they do decide they want to throw the football. Unglug comes in. He's got the answer. Capice along the sidelines, ready to come in. He's practicing kicking. He's almost right in front of Bobby Bowden that you saw right there. Capice is walking down. He's at the 35 now saying, hey, fellas, if it doesn't go in, I'm going in. Stockstill puts it up in the end zone. Unglug, touchdown! Absolutely ran right around the defensive back and made the catch. Lynn Thomas is the man he beat. 13 yard field goal, but remember the fumble on the 28 set it up. I mean, 13 yard TD. Well, who would have thought it? Florida State just comes roaring back, no matter what Pittsburgh does. This ball game is still in the half. 10-24 to go. Capice still has not missed a point after all year long. And the score now is 36 to 22 with 10 minutes and 24 seconds to go on a 13-yard pass to Unlaw. After recovery, the fumble by McCall at the 28-yard line by Hester. There's Capice. There's Hawkins inside the end zone, bringing it out, and just does get to the 19 or 20 yard line. Results are the same. Dan Marino and company have a long way to go. And you've got to be patient when you've got 10 minutes and 17 seconds. You don't want to try to force it. They sit on the scoreboard this time Bill Capice and Ron Stark, Super Toe and Thunderfoot. Known as the dynamic duo. Well, they've been dynamic tonight and apparently all year long. This is the first time Bud and I've seen them, but here comes Pittsburgh. Collier goes wide left. Collins comes to the right. And Marino with that excellent protection. There's the first time they got to him. He got rid of it, and the ball is dropped. Dropped by Dombrowski at the 28 yard line. Simmons was the man coming the nose guard, and that's about as close as you'll see them come all night. I think Simmons got by Amo Boris, a right guard, who slowly picked himself up. Dombrowski jumped too soon for the ball. Had he kept his stride and gone up at the right time, I believe he could have made the catch. Fine move, though, by Marino. Second down, 10. This time, Collins comes with Benji Pryor wide to the right. They've got two receivers split on the left. Marino back. Throws it to the outlet man, and that is McMillan, the fullback, and he is hit inside the 20-yard line. Actually lost a yard on the play. Reggie Herring, number 39, the first man to hit him, along with Bobby Butler, number 21. Excellent pass defense downfield by Florida State. Marino had plenty of time. There was no one open. He had to dump the ball off and completed the pass, but no yardage. Ball is back at the 18-yard line. It is third down and 12 to go. 9.35 left. The clock now becomes very important. Big play here for Pittsburgh to keep it rolling and keep the ball in their possession to try to fight back. Marino has to throw it quickly. Collins is there. And it's knocked down. Collins was double, maybe triple team. But I think Gary Henry, number 40, is the man who got his hands on the ball first. And it's fourth down, and Hepler will have to kick it away. Great defensive series by Florida State, as you can tell by listening to the crowd reaction. Pittsburgh has moved the ball almost at ease in the third quarter, but the Florida State defense adjusted very well, shut them down totally that time. 
Epler standing inside his own five yard line. Gary Henry, who was in on that last defensive play, back at the 46 yard line of Florida State. Long count. They've got eight men on the line of scrimmage. Another line drive. It'll allow Henry to bring the ball back a little bit, try to get outside where Wall is on the far side. He does get outside down the sidelines inside the 40 yard line and excellent field position for Florida State. First down Florida State and would it be something in northern Florida to take both Nebraska and Pittsburgh back to back. 39 yard punt here as you can see on the replay low line drive. Return by Henry. He sets it up well gets to the sidelines finds the wall of blockers picks up 19 yards on the return so once again Pittsburgh has made only 20 net yards on the punt and once again excellent field position for Florida State from a 38 yard line of Pittsburgh Knoxville the fake the handoff and Whiting takes it for perhaps a yard and that is all Mike Whiting the fullback out of Largo. Well, you can see Hugh Green up top wrestling him down, but Green came up after the slow Mike uh, Mark record slowed him to a walk. It's second down and ten. Eight thirty-eight left. Florida State by two touchdowns. There's Platt. He's been having an outstanding night, but not there. He slips after picking up a couple of yards. It'll be third down. And seven to go near the 35 yard line of the Pittsburgh Panthers. And that's the first time I've seen the artificial, the uh, grass rather, uh, tear up when a back tried to make a cut. This is an excellent grass field. Matter of fact, Bud, you made that statement before the game as you walked across it. This is one of the better grass fields you've seen anywhere. If they were all like this, uh, you'd recommend playing on grass, particularly Kurt, if there's no rain. Kurt Unglob, who caught a touchdown pass just moments ago, has come in with the play and a split wide to the right. And Stockstill on third down and about eight to go has a lot of time on a spin out. Now he's going to spin with himself inside the 30 yard line. Shy of the first down. Shy of the first down. Where they mark it at the 29 yard line. It's got to get to the 28. But it is so close. They have demanded that they take a look at the sticks. But I think he's about a yard or a half a yard shy. He really has to get to the 28. He made an awfully good read though before he decided to run for it and he made a very aggressive move. That's about a yard to go. And now let's see what they do. Capice is coming out. He would like to. Were you in doubt about what they did Jim? <laughs> Put this out of reach if he can. Now Capice tonight is five for five in field goals and for the year 14 of 15 in field goals. The only one is missed has been from 51 yards out. This will be from 46 yards out. 744 to go and would be his sixth field goal if he makes it. Time is called. They're getting the stick set on the far sideline. Now Paul Schmidt, the referee, says we're ready. On the 46 yard line, this may not make it, and it does not. I'm shocked. <laughs> 36 to 22. The score remains. Florida State ran some important time off that clock. As we told you that the piece has got the record, but he wanted to increase that record. Before tonight, it was four field goals against South Carolina 10 years ago in one game. A piece, well, way back in the third quarter, made it five, and then. Trying to make it six. Ball is on the 36 yard line. Collins again along with Collier wide left. It is second down and only three to go. And they're running the football trying to get something going to set up the passing game. And Arthur Hawkins isn't going anywhere as Ron Hester and James Gilbert numbers 83 and 51 put him down. And now it is third down and about three to go. 
The ball at the 36. Excuse me, Jimmy. He didn't make a very good read that time. It was open to the outside. He tried to cut it back inside. I think he could have picked up the first down and he taken it to the sidelines. I think it is obvious to say right here that Dan Marino and his troops need a first down. Less than seven minutes to go and down by 14 points. They got to keep the football. And that may do it. The ball is juggled out of there. Threw out of his hands as he was hit to Monk Bonasort, a native of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. We'll go back to Pittsburgh and talk about that one. He said, "If I win tonight, meaning we win tonight, I can go back to Pittsburgh. If not, they'll be waiting for me." Sixth turnover by the Panthers. That ball, not Marino's fault. He got it into the hands of Cotter, who fumbled it away. Now let us see how they're going to stick to the ground, giving it to Platt. Platt runs into a stack of people, including one of his own blockers, as he gets to the 43-yard line. A gain of a couple. Let's call it second down and seven. But more importantly, the clock continues to run. 36-22, Florida State. And you can see it running with now less than six and a half minutes. And if uh, you keep the ball on the ground, the clock obviously keeps running. If you throw it and it's incomplete, you kill the clock. With a 14-point lead, I'll be shocked if Florida State puts it in the air. There is Sam Platt with more than 100 yards tonight, adding some more still on his feet and close to a first down. It'll be third and short as Platt gets inside the 40-yard line. Cano is in on the tackle, along with number 29, Dan Short. And now Unglob comes on to the field. Johnson comes out. Unglob brings on the play. The wide receivers alternate with plays. On the other side of the line of scrimmage, Marino calls about 60% of his own plays at the line of scrimmage. 36-22, five and a half minutes to go. Stockdale still with the football, running with the football. He's got mobility, and he's dragged down. And guess who did it? Boy, from all the way across the field. Hugh Green, number 99. And they get some affectionate pats from a Florida State staff that figures that they've done a pretty good job on Mr. Green tonight. He's been outstanding, but they've been able to keep him out of too many big plays, with a notable exception of the first play from scrimmage when he hit Stockstill for a loss all the way back to the one yard line. And that's back in the first moments of the game. That was a very big play there because uh, if Florida State picks up the first down, they could kill enough time on the clock to cinch the victory. Well, let's see if Stark can kick the ball out inside the 20. I he's mean, he's done kicked, everything else. He can <laughs> kick it everywhere, but let's see if he can kick it out. No, he just kicks it straight away, and it went off the side of his foot. However, I do believe. I don't think he angled it that far. Maybe I'm wrong, but he did a good job. It's out on the 12, and they'll take it. I think you're absolutely right. He shanked it a little bit, but uh, when things are going well, they go well. Here's a fellow that's an outstanding kicker, but for the first time, he didn't have to get a lot of foot into it. 23 yard kick but at that point in time getting it inside the 20 yard line he saved eight yards or 44 left and if it goes by with the scores it is now 36 22 Florida State will have upset Nebraska at Nebraska and Pittsburgh here both teams undefeated before they met them and you better respect the Seminoles Moreno gets the ball away on the far side of the field. The man is triple teamed. That is Dombrowski, I believe, number 82, and that is. 4.36 to go. And there's a flag on the play, and it may be holding. As Pittsburgh walks back, Dombrowski is dumbfounded. No signal yet from the officials, but it is obvious it is against the Panthers. Putting them back inside the five. Holding is the charge. They did not get to Marino, but the officials detected that one of the reasons why is they were holding. Bill Capice, five field goals tonight. Rick Stockstill, touchdown passes tonight. There is Collins who can outrun everybody and he is close to a first down across the 20 yard line. Bobby Butler number 21 made the tackle. Florida State's playing very conservatively defensively. Two safety men back about 20 yards the linebackers back. Just don't let them make any 
type of breakaway play, and the clock is going to protect us. Four minutes, nine seconds left. The fans, if anybody's gone for the exits, I have not seen them. Because they figure they're sitting in on something that they only heard about last year or last week, and that was the win over Nebraska. Marino's asking for a dry football, and we're getting a little discussion, the referee, and he said uh, maybe you should have told me a little bit sooner about it. But, uh, okay, we will give you a dry ball, but we'll wind the clock. You got 25 seconds to get it in play. Well, someone said I think it's Charlie Dress the football. Statistics are for losers. Marino's got 272 yards, but he changed it right now for a touchdown. They need points. Now here is Benji Pryor up to this side, and there he goes back. Ron Hester, number 83, who was forced into action tonight because Borowski had the appendectomy. He has played an outstanding game, including recovering the fumble moments ago that set up yet another score. You really have got to give great credit to the Florida State defense also. They Pittsburgh is very capable of moving the football as Pittsburgh takes a timeout, but Florida State has made them work for everything that they've done and they have forced the turnovers. 52,894 paid their way in here tonight. A lot of people watching in the Tallahassee area live on television and millions more here on ESPN. And two to go the ball on the 20 yard line of Pittsburgh. 324 left. And Marino has not lost too many times in his short career with Pittsburgh. He's only a sophomore. And this is a good Pittsburgh team. Marino still protected. And the ball is not held. Coming out of the backfield was McMillan turning up field. He might have had the first down, but fumbled the football. He was looking for some place to run and not concentrating on the catch. And out is fourth down, and Marino is staying out on the field. Got to go for it. They've got to with 324 left. And if they do not get it, you would think at worst Bill Capice would have field goal number six tonight, unless they just choose to hang on and fall on the football. Also, I think Florida State's got the game won. <laughs> Adams comes wide right. Powder goes to the left. The crowd gets up on fourth down, standing room, watching the ball be tipped, and it is caught by Dombrowski. And that'll be the first down out across the 35 yard line. And that was a clutch catch to keep Pittsburgh's hopes alive. You wonder how he could make this catch. Uh, they've dropped a few easy balls, and then this is a sensational catch. Ball is batted. Batted balls are usually intercepted. Dombrowski goes high in the air to make the catch. Keith Jones wrestled him down. Here's Marino again, and there's Collier. And that is incomplete at the 46 yard line of Florida State. It is second down with 318 left. And now I can see the first vestiges of people who figure our team has won it and are starting to leave Doak Campbell Stadium. I don't think they should be that positive. If Pittsburgh gets <laughs> one on the board, gets an onside kick, uh, this thing's not over. Uh, Panthers can strike very quickly. But a few folks say, ah, it'll never happen. Don't be so sure. Don't you be so sure. Stick with us. This Marino can throw the football. And he gets all the time, gets the ball away. Got it for Collins. And across the way, Bobby Butler makes the interception. And Marino is standing down inside his own five yard line, hands on his hips, walking off, very disconsolate. There he is. Now at the 10, he realizes that's all she wrote. Seven turnovers by the Panthers. And that is a classic way to lose a football game. Seven turnovers. Plus, don't ever get the ball outside of your own 20-yard line on the exchange except once. Rick Stockstill, they can't say enough about him. He was down 7 nothing, and then brought him back, hitting Hardis Johnson and then Shoulders. The end around to McKinnon. McKinnon's across the 40-yard line. Dennis McKinnon, the wide receiver around, and Florida State hasn't gone conservative at all. They didn't put it in the air, but they're trying to keep the football to move it, and they got a first down. Jackson is very upset with himself, having missed the tackle. 
That kind of a play runs a lot of seconds, even though you don't make anything. You run it all the way across the field one way, you reverse it, bring it back all the way across the field the other way, but Jackson overruns it. And they pick up a first down on the play as well as run the time off the clock. On the 41 yard line, first down, Florida State. And this is Whiting as a flag goes down, and it might be that Pittsburgh was charging offside on that play. If so, that's nifty for Florida State because it would give them first and five, and it would be tragic for Pittsburgh because they will have given them five easy yards. I think Bill, another down. Bill Neal beat the jump, beat the count. Paul Smith has had his hands full tonight, marking off five yards here. We've talked about the kicking game and the field goal kicking, field position, but the Florida State offense has also done a great job. Pittsburgh in the fourth quarter had the ball only four minutes and 31 seconds. As you see, Meisner jump offside. First and five, Stockstill coming back to the huddle now. He went to the sideline during the pacing off of the penalty. Two and a half minutes to go. Well, I guess the Cinderella story in this land of at least near to Disney World has come true. Cross State at Orlando, Florida State Seminoles. Marino has almost doubled that, but his team is down by 14 points. And the handoff to the second man through is still on his feet, and that is, let's make it the first man through, Mike Whiting. Down to 210 and counting. It'll be second down and five to go as Whiting picks up no yardage at all. Jay Pelusi is in as a middle guard and he made the stop. Less than two minutes to go. Happy crowd. Unbelievably happy crowd. Well, they had 5,000 cars full of people waiting for them when they got back from Nebraska last week. It couldn't move. I don't know what will happen tonight. I guess everybody will don't have to. Uh, wait for them because they're right here in their own hometown and there goes Platt first down and Platt has had a remarkable night against a team that is second in the nation rushing defense allowing only 31 yards per game before tonight and Platt himself is well over 100. They've taken advantage of the way Pittsburgh has played their defense and I don't mean that critically of how Pittsburgh has played their defense. Uh, Florida State has not run the ball well. They felt that they had to rush stock still and by rushing you penetrate you lose the pursuit one minute 15 seconds to go here goes McKinnon again around the other way and McKinnon gets down to the 40 yard line that will be second down and two to go clock runs and folks we are now under one minute the sweep action here as stock still pitches the ball back and there comes the reverse Again, the play uses up all kinds of time, and this young man can carry the football. Two oh. Pittsburgh men, he splits them, almost picks up the first down. On the sidelines, Bill Capis has got the whole team saying, we're number one, and there's the blitz, and I think they're offside. But Platt's got the football. Flags are down. Time is running out. I've been waiting for him to run that fake reverse, which they did that time. And Platt faked it, kept it. Across the way, they're looking at a Florida State man who went down. That was a vicious bit of play across there. And I don't mean that it was untoward. I just simply mean it was a hard, hard hit. And a man is down with 25 seconds to go. 36-22, Florida State. They've done it. Number three, Nebraska last week. Number three, Pittsburgh this week. And as I said, Bill Capice and company, I've been raising the finger number one. I don't think they'll get there despite the fact that Alabama is a squeaker today. Bobby Bowden done an outstanding job since coming down here from West Virginia. And we still cannot see who that man is across the way. And he is up and we now know it is Emil Ryan, a guard, and apparently just took a real hit. Eric Ryan. And that kind of night, third down and couple of yards to go. The clock is running 23. They don't even have to run a play if they don't want to 20. 15. Great great victory for Florida State a shocker for Pittsburgh undefeated and third ranked in one of the polls. There's Ricky Williams and that's going to be all six. He'll count it down. Ladies and gentlemen, you 
seen one of the big upsets. Pittsburgh undefeated, slightly favored. And turn it around. Florida State winning 36 to 22 has now in successive weeks defeated Nebraska at Lincoln, Nebraska. The Cornhuskers first loss. And tonight, the Panthers of Pittsburgh here in Tallahassee. Final score, Florida State 36 with Capice kicking five field goals. Pittsburgh with all those turnovers, 22. The triumphant Phillies and their families return to Philadelphia. A crowd of some 4,000 turned out to cheer their heroes at the airport. They were more restrained than the ticket line fans, but just as enthusiastic. After all, they do have something to cheer about. It's been 30 long years since a World Series has been played in the city of brotherly love. Richard Wagner, CBS News, Philadelphia. For CBS News, on this 345th day of captivity for the American hostages in Iran, Dan Rather in New York, thank you for joining us. Good night. At Century 21, we're making things happen. Our Century 21 agent found this investment property for us with an interest-only second mortgage from the seller. Our Century 21 agent showed us how to finance the sale of our farm ourselves. And we got enough cash to buy a little resort. If you're investing in real estate, call your Century 21 agent today for this booklet, Alternative Financing. At Century 21, we're making things happen. And we'll give our word to you. Sir, have you ever had a Stouffer's French bread pizza? Uh, gee, I, I guess so. Maybe you've forgotten how good they taste. Italian cheese's perfectly blended sauce. Oh, that sure looks good. Take your pick, Deluxe, uh, sausage and mushroom, pepperoni. Hey, it's really good. Fresh tasting. Just one thing. Yes? Isn't it a little funny looking for a pizza? Well, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Stouffer's, the funny looking pizza with a great fresh taste. This has been the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather substituting for Walter Cronkite. Ed Clark and Barry Commoner, the presidential candidates you might have overlooked. What do they stand for and whom do they represent? Walter Cronkite reports on Campaign Countdown Wednesday night. This is CBS. Derby. I have no ken of how they do it, but surely they do do it. I do not know how they do it, but they do it. <laughs> For great food at a modest price, Brown Derby does it every time. I don't know how they do it, <laughs> but they do it. <laughs> the Brown Derby is your place to celebrate before and after the Seminole games. They're proud to support the Seminoles and hope you'll join them for fun. Channel 6 Television, WCTV, Thomasville, Tallahassee. Bowden Show, featuring highlights of the Florida State-Pittsburgh football game, is brought to you by Merrill Lynch. In today's economy, you need a brokerage firm that's a breed apart. By Burger King, where you can win two free tickets to the Florida State-Florida game. Enter the showdown sweepstakes today at Burger King. By the members of Dairy Farmers Incorporated, local producers of the natural nutrition, fresh Florida milk. By Likes Meats, bite the best this season. And by the Prudential Insurance Company of America. For life, health, auto, or home insurance, see your Prudential Insurance representative today. Here's Seminole head football coach Bobby Bowden. Those Florida State football players deserve a pat on their back for uh, the accomplishments they have had the past two weeks. Uh, we've never uh, taken on the likes of, a, of Nebraska there and then Pitt here, both of them nationally ranked. Many people had Pittsburgh picked as the number one team in the nation at the beginning of the season. I know Sports Illustrated had picked them as number one, and several newspapers had picked them the same way. 
and for these players of ours to, to beat uh, Nebraska, who was number three in the nation, and then the very next week, Pitt moves up to number three in the nation, and we were able to knock them off, and knock them off uh, pretty decisively. I am just so proud of our, our football players. I'm proud of our assistant coaches for the game plan they had, and uh, it's just good for Florida State University. We had a funny, uh, not a funny thing, <laughs> an odd thing happened last week. Paul Porowski, who was lineman of the week in the nation, uh, also in the southeast, uh, after our win over Nebraska, uh, just had a great game, had his picture in all every paper in the country, and then the very next day, he gets appendicitis, has to have his appendix taken out, and of course, we play without him. And I've got to give Ron Hester, a uh, junior from uh, Umatilla, Florida, a great pat on the back from uh, me and our staff and our teammates for the job he did uh, filling in for Ron. I tell you, I knew we were going to have a good night because we had probably we had one of those old-fashioned pep rallies uh, last Thursday night, a well, bonfire and everything. And I'll, we'll tell you a little bit more about it. Uh, but let's uh, have this commercial. High school days come only once. Last and good times by the bunch. Make it special before it slips away. Loving all these special times you hope they never end. Keep them going special. Make it Burger King and Friends. Burger King and Friends. Make it fries, crisp and light. Tasty shakes fixed up right. Make it special. Make it Burger King. Could a quarterback reach the goal line if he were completely alone without his team? Of course not. Teamwork is an essential element in reaching goals. Your goals in life are more difficult than those of football. Prudential can help you reach your most important goals. Your Prudential team can provide you with a strong defense. Solid as a rock, with life, health, auto, and home insurance, Prudential can provide the protection you need to help reach your goal lines. Call your Prudential agent today. The field can be a lonely place without your team. And now I'm happy to tell you about an important report available from the 42 Merrill Lynch offices in Florida. If you'd like to be a better investor, and who wouldn't, get a pen and a piece of paper right now, because I'm going to tell you about a special report on stock selection, timing, and techniques that you can get free. It tells some of the guidelines used by financial experts to help them decide when to buy a stock and when to sell it. Can you imagine having that kind of information on hand when you're about to make a decision? And not only does this report help remove the mystery from stock selection and timing, it also includes special investment techniques, such as buying on margin, trading in options, and selling short. It might make you a lot more confident of your decisions the next time you invest. Now, the Merrill Lynch offices in Florida want to give you this report free, and here's how to get it. Ask for the Merrill Lynch report on timing. Now, call Monday through Friday, 8.30 a.m. to 5.30 p.m., Eastern Standard Time. Well, we had over 52,000 people, I think 52,890 or something like that, and broke all of our attendance records again at Florida State. There we come out on the field. You see our uh, uh, renegade, our horse, and uh, Chief Osceola, our mascot. We get off to a great start. Uh, again, the crowd was excellent. They kick off. We bobble the ball. Larry Harris, freshman from Gainesville, picks the ball up, and we get the ball back to the 13-yard line. They get good coverage. Number 20 there is Ken Burnett from Brandon. Okay, they got us backed off right there. That's number 99, Hugh Green from Pitt. Uh, this will be the last year we have to look at him. There's Sam Platt uh, from Jacksonville, Florida, making a nice run there. Zeke Mowat, number 81 from Wachula. Uh, got a nice telegram from Tom Underwood from down in Wachula last week. Uh, Stark punched the football there, and it got a bad bounce. So uh, Hester, number 83 there, he's in a way he's in a slip over jersey. You see him taking it off. We have to change his number to get him on a punt team. They run the football there, and we have a good tackle right off the bat. Number 83, Hester. Ron Hester from Umatilla, Florida, was taking the place of Paul Porowski, who had an appendectomy. Watch his touchdown. We had the thing covered. Bobby said he was afraid to jump up with him. He was afraid to get an interception. Keith Jones uh, from uh, Wildwood, Florida, gets over and gets a hit. But they score on the second, second play. Their second play from scrimmage, they score, they take a 7-0 lead. And the one thing we didn't want to happen, a long play. We felt like to beat them, we had to cut out the long play. And right off the bat, they get one. They kick the ball off. It's taken by Larry Harris. Uh, and he brings the ball back to the 22-yard line. There's 84, Sam Childers from Tallahassee. 46 is... Uh, not sure who that was. Oh, boy, look at him knock Sam's hat off. 
Number uh, 58 there for Pitt, one of their uh, fine defensive tackles. There's Phil Wheels running in motion. Stock still back to pass. This team of Pitt puts a great pass rush on. I, we, we protected our passer better than we ever have. There was a throw in there to Phil Williams. This will give you another shot of the same thing. Ron goes, I mean, uh, Stock still goes back to pass. Now we try to throw a, a takeoff pattern down here. They have it covered. Hardest Johnson, number 22 from Tampa, Florida. The Stark comes in and punts, and I tell you, our kicking game with Capice and uh, Stark has been exceptional again. Uh, just been, has been exceptional. Rita's Coggins, number 66 there, covering for our punt team, was the first man down. Okay, here's Marino, their great quarterback, back to pass. He hits Benji Pryor across the middle, but they un they knocked the ball out of there. I see James Harris, number 33. I see Gary Futch there, 79 from Ocala, James Harris from Gainesville. Number 60 there is uh, uh, Scott McLean from uh, Claremont. Florida. Watch this. Over the middle he goes to that big tight end of this. Bump, a nice hit there. That's probably 28. Keith Jones causing that. He, he makes some fine plays inside. 21 is Bobby Butler. 64 is Jarvis Corsi. Okay, now we get the ball back. Okay, here, oh, look at, look at uh, Mr. Whiting from Largo, Florida. Mike Whiting makes, I think he had a, a, a nice run in there, about 16 yards, and, and we can't knock it in, so Bill Capice comes in and kicks the extra field goal there, and now Pitt has a, has a seven to three. But that, those first three points right there really got our momentum going, uh, caused by a fumble uh, by our defensive team of the Pitt offense. Bill Capice kicks off, and as usual, there are not very many of them, uh, returnable. Oh, number 51 there, James Gilbert deflects that pass. Marino was trying to throw across the middle. They punt the football, and uh, the ball runs in the end zone. Uh, Monk Bonasort, 42 there, protecting to let that ball go in. What they did, they shifted their quarterback back to the punt, and we thought they might go for it. Okay, here's Stock still back to pass. We need a big, uh, oh, a, a real fine completion there to, to uh, Phil Williams again. Phil Williams, I, I'm so proud of him because he came to Florida State as a walk-on. Oh, and they get a big quarterback sack there. They got, they got our quarterback there, and uh, uh, John Madden, number 58 there from Fort Walton Beach, uh, started for us for the first time uh, since the East Carolina ball game. He's been out with two weeks. Meant a lot having him back. Start, punts again, and watch his punt. Watch their punt, I have to turn, and look at that punt. Have you ever seen anything like that in your life? He averaged, he averaged 48 one points, so there's a clip down on number 30. He averaged 48.1 yards a punt, and he had to kick 125 yards because he was kicking it out of bounds on the 10-yard line. I see Arthur Scott, number uh, 54 there. Looks like he might come up with a formal. Ron Simmons, number 50. Alfonso Carrica, number 76. He's a freshman, 6'6", 235 pounds from Columbus, Ohio. Okay, here's Platt. Platt doing a good job of running. We did a, we did a much better. That's Hugh Green, number 99. They're great defensive end, one of the greatest I've ever seen. But Florida State got more, Sam Platt gained more yards rushing against Pitt than, than every opponent total for the season. All right, they, kick, they punt and they fumble the football. It looks like we get old Trent Barnes, 65, from down around Lake, and he's excited. Phil Williams from up in Griffin, Georgia there. And uh, there's, uh, that was, uh, I believe that was Ron Hester again returning that. So Stock still goes back. He's looking for Hardest Johnson down the sideline. They played it real good. We come up with an incompletion. We're trying to get on that board now. Looks like they're going to get us for a chop block. That's that new chop block rule they've got. And they, they get us. Now, here's Sam Platt on a real fine run. Look at Platt. Real fine run. We got some good blocking. And uh, Platt, I, oh, I was, I was so happy with Sam Platt from Jacksonville. And uh, here's Platt again. And uh, they just whipped us right there at the line of scrimmage there. Anytime they break through that solid. 62, there's Eric Ryan from Sarasota, Florida. The stock still goes back. He hits hardest Johnson for a touchdown. And uh, it puts Florida State in the lead, uh, and uh, what a play that was. Stock still had a very good night, threw three touchdown passes. Unglob sets the ball down, and uh, Bill Capice kicks another extra point. Bill Capice kicked five field goals the other night. I, I feel sure he would have had a six one, but we got a high snap, and the ball got down late, and uh, the timing was off. And Bill had it right down the middle, but he hit it a little too high. It was, it was uh, not, didn't have his usual thud behind it. Okay, we kick off again. They started to bring it out, and he fumbled it. He picks it up again. Uh, I'm not sure who that is for them, but I see uh, old Harvey Clayton down there from Homestead. Mike Smith, number seven, from uh, Panama City is down there on the tackle. So, okay, Florida State lines up. Now, this is when Marino, the quarterback from Pitt, was complaining about the crowd noise. I've never, I've never heard a noisy of Florida State crowd in my life. That stadium, I guarantee you, those Seminoles made more noise than that 52,000 
than uh, LSU makes with, with 78,000. So their quarterback is, uh, is kind of getting on. I, I want the crowd to do this. I like that noise, but when we roll, hold our hands up and wave them to quiet, please be quiet because uh, you can see where a penalty right down here would really hurt. But they were just enthusiastic. They wasn't doing it on purpose. They were just enthusiastic. I could tell by the pep rally the other night they were going to be enthusiastic. We had, we had one of those old-fashioned pep rallies, you know, where you had the bonfire and everybody came and uh, they punt the football and old Gary Henry back there from Orlando decides to let it hit because it was short and it wasn't, uh, and we got good field position. We're on their side of the, on their side of the 50. And uh, there's Sam Pat with a, look at Sam run. Boy, was I proud of him. Sam didn't quite get in here. I think he came up about a yard short here of the touchdown. That would have been a fantastic touchdown run by Sam Platt against what many think is the number one defense in the nation. Sam Childers from Tallahassee, Florida, uh, catches another touchdown pass from Rick Stocksteel. Number six there, you see Dennis McKinnon from Miami, Florida. 99, uh, Rick Voltapetti from Miami, Florida. And uh, then uh, Bill Capice comes in and kicks another extra point. So now Florida State has a 17 to seven lead. All right, we get the ball back. There's a handoff to, to Platt again. Watch him run. They get a Hugh Green, number 99, the All-American in at uh, Pitt. He'll make tackle after tackle after tackle. He was indeed a great football player. But thank goodness our team was better this past week. OK, Stock's back. He looks, he finds Zeke Mowat from Wachula coming across the middle. And Zeke runs for a first down. Zeke Mowat, to me, is one of the most improved football players on our team from now in spring. Bill Capice comes in and drills another field goal, and it puts Florida State out ahead 20 to 7. Now, we only had about 50 seconds left. Or it was 37 seconds, you can tell by that clock there. And they're going to throw an interception, a great interception by Keith Jones. Right here, watch it. Keith Jones, an interception, and Bill Capice comes in and drills a big field. Watch this. A fine job there. Gary Henry and uh, uh, Keith Jones. Bobby Butler blocking us, picks up another block by uh, Hester, uh, Hester from Umatilla. And now we got just a couple of seconds on the clock. Reggie Herring comes over and calls a timeout. Bill Capice comes in, and Florida State takes a 23-7 uh, to seven halftime lead. And uh, I'll be back with a second half action uh, right after this timeout. Most people think two rivals like us could never agree on anything. They're wrong. We agree that everybody loves a winner. A wiener, Charlie, a wiener. Bobby, I thought we were talking about football, not hot dogs. Well, not just any hot dog, Charlie. I like plumper hot dogs. The best you can buy. Mm, the best you can bite, too. Huh? Because these are the kind our fans like best. You mean we really do agree on something? Finally. Hey, folks, this hot dog just made history. Likes hot dogs. They're the best you can bite. Milk and good food go together at the natural taste of cheese. Team them up every day for a tastier way to make the most of your favorite meal. Milk and good food go together and cheese as a slice of life. So when you want to please, it's easy with cheese and the natural nutrition of milk. You know, the best kind of advertising is word of mouth. I believe in it. And I'd never agree to recommend something if I didn't have plenty of good experiences to share. Like the Brothers Three. I've had my family here, my team here, even my mother-in-law. And when my wife threw a surprise party for me, you guessed it. The Brothers Three has the most complete banquet facilities you can find. Exquisite steaks and seafood that's fresh that day. Or oh, they won't serve it. First class. That's Brothers Three. I recommend it. Make it a day, you and him. Now it's time for his first trim. Make it special, it'll be okay. A little snip, a little clip, now there it's not so bad. You're ready for a special treat at Burger King with Dad. Juicy burgers, just his size. Feeling special with a shake and fries. Make it special, make it Burger King. You know, homecoming at Florida State is scheduled a little earlier this year, October the 17th and the 18th. Now, here's a very special lady, my wife Ann, to tell you about the homecoming events that you won't want to miss. This year, be there for all the great homecoming events at Florida State the weekend of October 17th and 18th. Our first homecoming queen will be the Grand Marshal of the Friday Afternoon Parade. 
Then there's the dinner dance with some fine swing music by Charlie Spivak and his orchestra. The powwow in Doe Campbell Stadium Friday night features the Little River Band and the Dirt Band. The alumni marching chiefs get together to rehearse for their musical pregame show, and the alumni cheerleaders return to boost our spirits even higher. Grads made good are honored at the Saturday breakfast, and everybody gathers for good eating at the fish fry before Saturday night fever takes hold. Bob Urich, a Florida State graduate and the star of TV's Vegas, is our very special guest. Yes, homecoming at Florida State is more than just a great football game. Call the alumni office early to get your tickets for all the events and bring the whole family. See you at homecoming. You know, this Pitt football team came into Tallahassee with, with one of the best defensive teams. I thought they were the best defensive we've played against yet, including the University of Miami and the University of Nebraska. Sam Platt gained more yards against uh, Pitt than all of the total yards gained by the four previous opponents. Now let's look at this second half. They come in here and run the football. You see number Reggie Herring, number 39, make a real fine play there. Uh, Ron Hester right on his heels there. And uh, now Marino's back to pass. Watch this. Another, another touchdown by Marino there. And uh, Monk Bonasort misses a ta uh, tackle. I don't think it was his uh, responsibility. I think he was on the zone trying to fill in. They throw go for two points. Find that big end, Benji Pryor, right down the middle. And buddy, it's, it's looking kind of bad now. They, it's 23 to 15. And uh, that shows you how quick a team like Pitt can score with a quarterback like Marino, who's one of the best in the country. We put Sam Platt back in there on a the kickoff, and he brings the ball out to the 17-yard line. Now we've got to get something going here now. All right, here comes uh, Stock still on the rollout. He runs the football, and uh, they collar him there. But he does make a few yards there. And uh, I think we might have to call Mr. Ron Stark back in the ball game. We've got a heck of an offensive about, uh, weapon. We'll start, look at that airplane there. Somebody threw it out of the stands. That thing stayed up in the air for a long time. About as long as one of Stark's punts. Now, I remember we get, made a great catch here by Kurt Unglob. That's right, kept this drive. Going. This was a very important drive by our offense because uh, this was third and long, and Stark still goes back, and Glob gets up in the air and makes a real fine catch before he's tackled by their safety man. Okay, uh-oh, somebody busted a play. That's a busted play. And no Hugh Green, he, he dares you to bust plays. I tell you, he's, a, he's, a, he's one of the best football players I've ever seen. And I, I, our offense did a heck of a job. Just keep looking here. Look at it. But we hit the screen on him. We hit the screen on him. And boy, Sam Platt does a good job of running here. Sam Platt sets, he gets, that was about a third down. I'll tell you what that was. That was third down and 20 or 30. And he got all but about three, or no, second down in that. He gets all of it back and then comes back on, I think, on the next play and gets the first down. Look at Sam run. He's running so well after he gets hit. 8-81 there. Zeke Mowat up from Wachula. Uh, and then uh, Bill Capice comes in and uh, kicks the field goal. What do you think about our weapon of Capice and Stark? I tell you, those two guys are unbelievable, aren't they? They both got a big write-up in Sports Illustrated this past weekend. And they come right back and do the same thing. There comes that airplane again. And I say it hangs. It's got about the same hang time as... Uh, one of Stark's uh, punts. Stark's punts wings don't fall off when they hit, though. Okay, Reggie here in 39 nearly had an interception, which would have meant a big touchdown for Florida State. Florida State's defense recovered four fumbles, intercepted three passes, that's seven turnovers, and that helped win the ball game. Oh, boy, that was a fine. That guy had that ball, but old Gary Henry, who keeps getting better every week. Gary Henry is, I am, I'm really excited about him, the effort he gives us. Comes in as our fifth back. And uh, he's getting a lot tougher. Watch, watch Gary here. Watch Gary here. Gary's going for that touch. Good run in there. Good run in there. Number 50 is Mr. Uh, Ron Simmons, who each week is beginning to get better and better, and I'm so happy. Unglob puts it down. Trent Barnes snaps it, and uh, Bill Capice kicks another field goal. That, might, that was either his fourth or fifth right there for the night. And now we take a 29-15 lead. Now, they came out and got eight points at the half. Uh, our offense answers them with three. So we cut that eight margin back down to five. There's some good hitting. Look at Hester, number 83. And uh, Bonasort, 42. Bonasort being from Pittsburgh. You think he didn't want to win this game? Man, he had a personal challenge over there, one of those Pitt players. A, a real fine reception by a, a Pitt player there. And uh, that Marino, ever dangerous. I think, he, look here, he brought him right back. He brought him right back. We stopped their full back there. Uh, Arthur Scotts, 54, from uh, Brandon, Florida. Gary Fletcher, but they jump over the top. There's a, at 34, there's a young man that we signed out of Miami, Florida, named Joe McCall. He changed his mind at the last moment and went to Pitt. 
And uh, he's, he scored his touchdown against us. They kicked the extra point. Now it's 29 to 22. All they got to get is a two-point conversion. They go ahead. They run their fullback, McMillan, up the middle. This is the 40 is the guy that ran wild in the Fiesta Bowl. If you saw the game, Pitt versus Arizona, number 40. We stopped him pretty decent. Oh, look at McCall give us the football. He fumbled the football, and we get it, and uh, we're going to go on some more points here. So, boy, what a, what a help that is. Oh, uh, so again, I think Simmons played better. Reggie Heron's a guy I like to pet on the back, though, coming in and playing for uh, Porowski. Watch this touchdown pass. And that's the third touchdown pass that uh, Rick Stockstill threw. Rick Stockstill, a very effective. Rick's dad was down for the ball game, and, and Rick's granddad was down from the, for the ball game. And, gosh, it's just good to see them. What a fine family they've got. And there's our, our, our fine mascot and our horse renegade. And what a Bill Durham and uh, Bill Smith and, and uh, the, the Chinaways. They've done a great job of getting that mascot going for us. Okay, we kick off again. Another fine kickoff by Florida State. And there's that number 46. Now, that's Mike Rodriguez from Tallahassee, Florida. I was trying to figure out who that was. Mike Rodriguez, who was a walk on at Florida State, is now on scholarship. And uh, here's Gary Henry on a, on a punt return. And he takes it down the sideline, and they make a real fine tackle there. But, buddy, he did a good job bringing that thing back. Reggie Heron, what we did at linebacker, and there's Bill Capice coming in and kicking. Uh, missed. He missed that one. Again, we didn't get that one down good. I won't, and uh, they throw a little slant across there. And Martin Bonasort comes in for a big interception. And uh, we're going to go down. And, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if we get nothing on the board here or not. Here's Pat. Look at Platt. Picking good. 84. Childers there blocking. 72. Ken Lanier blocking. 58 there is John Madden from Fort Walton. No, Stark, this is where Stark has to punt it uh, out of bounds. He punts it out of bound, uh, bounds on the 10-yard line. That's Ricky Williams down there covering. And 65 is Trenton Barnes and Rita Coggins from Chipley, Florida, all down recovering on that punt. But uh, Stark had to kick that thing out of bounds, a 25-yarder. If it hadn't for that, he'd have averaged over 50 yards a kick. We had 52,894 people there. Marino's back to pass. Looks like Simmons finally got to him. Bobby Butler on a real big interception, and that's their last possession. Now Florida State uh, starts the last drive of the day. There's a handoff to Ricky Williams, number 44, and Florida State takes a great 36 to 22 uh, win. And, uh, it, was a, it was a big one because, as I say, Pitt was nationally ranked coming in here. Now, we'll be back, and uh, uh, Gene Deckerhoff will tell you about next week's opponent, Boston College, after this message. Investors. Hello, I'm Brent Pichard. At Investors, we have caught Saturday Night Fever. But you know, whether it's winning football games or selling real estate, it takes a great deal more than just fever to get the job done. It takes better people, better training, a better organization, and a great deal of practice. And we have got it. And that's why we can say with confidence, you get the best with investors. Most people think Michelin makes a great radial tire. And we do. But a lot of people think Michelin X tires cost a lot more than other leading radials. They don't. We didn't get to be the fastest growing tire company in America by making a tire people can't afford. So go for the radio that goes for less than you think. Go for Michelin. Capital Car Care Center has your Michelins for every car. More miles, better handling, everything you buy a radial for. And when you buy three, the fourth one's free at Capital Car Care Center. Could a quarterback reach the goal line if he were completely alone without his team? Of course not. Teamwork is an essential element in reaching goals. Your goals in life are more difficult than those of football. Prudential can help you reach your most important goals. Your Prudential team can provide you with a strong defense, solid as a rock. With life, health, auto, and home insurance, Prudential can provide the protection you need to help reach your goal lines. Call your Prudential agent today. The field can be a lonely place without your team. High school days come only once. Last and good times by the bunch. Make it special before it slips away. Loving all these special times you hope they never end. Keep them going special. Make it Burger King and Friends. Burger King and Friends. Make it fries, crisp and light. Tasty shades fixed up right. Make it special. Make it Burger King. 
The Boston College Eagles have gotten off to a rocky start this year, dropping three of their first four games. But look at the competition. They lost to powerful Pittsburgh 14 to 6. Villanova caught them by surprise after they had stunned highly thought of Stanford 30 to 13. Then a rugged Navy defense blanked BC 21 to nothing. Defensively, big Jim Budness leads the Eagles. The 235-pound junior is considered the best linebacker ever at BC. Through four games, he recorded 35 tackles and one interception. The Seminoles will have to work around big number 38. It'll be tough to go through it. Offensively, quarterback John Lockery can move the Eagles through the air. He engineered BC's big win over Stanford with pinpoint passes like this one to wide receiver Rob Rickard. Only a sophomore, Lockery has hit 39 of 95 aerial attempts for 507 yards and two touchdowns. He has suffered seven interceptions, however. Head coach Ed Claybeck has shuffled his lineup around the last several weeks to try to get his club back on the right track. The Boston College Eagles. Twenty-seven Action News with Marianne Laughlin and Jerry Brown. I wouldn't care to go on record. You don't want to go on record. <laughs> I know some people around here that do have favorites. Not so. going to commit. Yet. <laughs> right. okay. Hello, everybody. Sports brought to you today by Taco Bell. The first rookie to start a World Series opener since 1952 will take the mound for the Phillies tonight. When Bob Walk goes against the veteran Kansas City pitcher Dennis Leonard, a 20-game winner this season. Dick Schaap takes a closer look at the key players in the 1980 World Series. On the brink of the 1980 World Series, the big men of the Kansas City Royals and the Philadelphia Phillies offensively are the two third basemen. George Brett of the Royals, who batted 390 during the regular season, the highest average in the major leagues in 39 years, and hit two home runs during the championship series, including this one to drive in the winning runs in the final game. And Mike Schmidt of the Phillies, who hit 48 home runs during the regular season to lead both major leagues, but suffered through a mediocre championship series against Houston. Schmidt is capable of turning his cold bat into a blazing weapon at any moment. But while the big third baseman, a pair of 200-pounders, are the logical potential heroes, the most valuable players of the championship series were two relatively little second basemen, both under 170 pounds. Manny Trio of Philadelphia, whose timely hitting and crisp fielding helped his team come back from a 2-1 deficit, and Frank White of the Royals, who led Kansas City in hitting against the Yankees. The star of last year's World Series was an ancient first baseman, 38-year-old Willie Stargell. The star of this year's could be an even more ancient first baseman, 39-year-old Pete Rose. Dick Schaap, ABC News. Should be an interesting series. Well, the latest wire service polls reflect the continuing success story of the Florida State football team as the Knowles moved up to seventh in both the AP and UPI polls. Here's a comparison of the top ten as both polls have pretty much agree all the way down to number nine. Alabama's Crimson Tide, number one. You'll see them at 3.30 on Saturday on Channel 27 against Tennessee. Southern Cal second. Texas is third. And UCLA hanging in there at number four. And Notre Dame rounding out the top five as complete agreement between the two polls. And in number six spot, Georgia on both polls. FSU holds number seven in both. North Carolina eighth. AP says uh, Ohio State is better than Nebraska, but UPI disagrees. They picked Nebraska ninth and the Ohio State Buckeyes in tenth position. Well, coming up on sports, a look at the Florida A&M Jackson State game. used to be sweet on Rick, but now I'm sweet on Taco Bell. Seminole place kicker Bill Capice has earned the title Super Toe this season, and not without good reason. Last Saturday night, he set a Florida State record with five field goals in a game, and he's already tied a single season mark for field goals. I asked Bill if he knew at the time that he could have tied a national record with a sixth field goal last Saturday. I realized it, and I, I went for it, but, you know, unfortunately, I didn't get it. Does this put more pressure on you now that uh, you're getting a, a lot of attention to, uh, drawn towards your kicking? No, I think it makes me work harder. I go out every day, practice, and I concentrate more and more each day that I go out, you know, because I want to just keep making them all and just keep adding on, you know, some field goals. Seems like after you make a field goal that you really drill that ball into the end zone. Is that, is that the adrenaline pumping? Or? Well, after I make a field goal, that kind of gets me fired up to kick off. and. Uh, 
And anyways, uh, you know, no matter what, I try to kick them all out of the end zone. You had to have a lot of satisfaction with those kicks at LSU, the kicks at Nebraska, but with this hometown crowd, uh, is there just a special feeling when you kick a field goal here? Oh, it sure is. Anything you do in the stadium, you know, makes you feel good because it is home, and you like to perform your best in front of your home crowd, and yes, it, it did make me happy. Must be nice to know if you get across the 50, you got a shot at some points. Well, the Florida A&M Rattlers have the weekend off before they take on tough, unbeaten South Carolina State. But last Saturday night, the Rattlers were victims of their own mistakes as well as a solid Jackson State team. As you see them coming on the field at Jackson, Mississippi, Jackson State is always a tough team, but they're particularly tough on the road. And the second play of the game, this just about told the story of this ball game. Keith Taylor firing 61 yards to Anthony Jenkins for a touchdown. Taylor hit 9 of 19 for 193 yards and with 14-14 still left in the first quarter, it was 7 to nothing in favor of Jackson State. Uh, Kuntz had throwing to Bobby Hawkins. He had some good success going to Hawkins. Hawkins really had a fine game. The, the uh, converted wing back who is now a wide receiver for uh, FAMU. And Kuntz hit 8 of 16, but this might be the key to the ball game right here. Kuntz back <coughs> and he scrambles, he's tackled, and he's injured. <coughs> Pardon me. And uh, he had to come out of the game and they had to put a freshman in, and you see Pete Barringer had some problems there and some problems throughout the rest of the game. And when Kuntz came back, uh, that drive, of course, was destroyed, and they lost by the score 10 to nothing. Well, Jacksonville Mayor Jack Godbowl is asking the city council for emergency funds to repair the Gator Bowl Stadium so it'll be safe enough to host the November 8th Georgia-Florida football game. A structural engineering study revealed the facility is unsafe in its present condition. The cost of the repair job is estimated at $200,000. Well, last night on Monday Night Football, the Denver Broncos slipped past the Washington Redskins by the score of 20 to 17. In first quarter action, Denver's Rick Upchurch made a fine catch of Matt Robinson's pass uh, to put the ball on the Washington 9. And then two plays later, Otis Armstrong scored from the 7, and the Broncos led 7 to nothing. The only score the Redskins could get in the first quarter was a field goal from Mark Mosley. Then, late in the second quarter, Denver's Fred Steinforce stunned the Redskins with a 57-yard field goal, and that made it 10-3 at the half. In the third quarter, Wilbur Jackson's going to take a handoff here in a minute, and you'll see him break through the entire defense for 45 yards, and this ties the game up at 10-10. Then there are, as... Uh, the two teams were dead even at this point, and Fred Steinforth went. Wolf, hopefully better known around Tallahassee as the Big Bad Wolf, and we're here for another Big Bad Wolf on sports. Brought to you through the courtesy of Clearview Cable TV, Public Access Channel 11. Now get that, that's Channel 11 on your dial, not Channel 3. This is not WFSU TV. So all you people out there that keep telling me you missed my show because you tuned in Channel 3, it's your own fault. It's Channel 11. Now, let's get on with the show. By the way, our engineer producer is Richard Davis doing another fine job. My guest today is one of the bigger Seminoles on the football team. Uh, I might say he's big in the news. He's probably the best place kicker in the entire United States as far as the college level goes right now. And I don't want to burst his head because he's already a uh, very confident individual. He's not cocky like some people say. He just has a lot of confidence in himself. And that's Bill Capice, the place kicker for the Florida State Seminoles. Bill, it's good to have you on the show. It's good to be here, Dick. We're going to talk about uh, the Florida State Seminoles, of course, and about yourself and about your, your kicking expertise. But first off, let's give the people a little background. Where were you born? How did you get into place kicking? Where did you go to high school? And how did you come to Florida State? Uh, I was uh, born in Miami, Florida, and uh, the way I got into place kicking, I, uh, I played soccer when I was young, when I was 12, 13 years old in a, a little league, and, I, uh, and in the ninth grade, I, I was on this uh, Optimist Football League, and uh, like I was a running back there, and like two, two days before our first game, the coach, you know, we was trying to get together plays for the offense and plays for the defense and worrying about the season. You know, he forgot about a, a, that he needed a kicker. So, uh, coach, you know, he got all nervous two days before the game. He goes, "Hey, I forgot. You know, who, who's gonna kick? Who can kick around here?" And so about ten of us raised our hand, and uh, I never kicked the football in my life, but uh, you know, I just raised my hand because I thought I could do it. And we had tryouts, ten of us, and, and I, I happened to be the best at that time. You know, I wasn't real good at it because it was my first time, but I was the best out of all, all those other guys, and. Uh, 
I kicked then. I was kicking 35-yard field goals when I was 13 years old. And then I, I just, then I went to high school. My sophomore year in high school, I played JV ball. I kicked there, and I, I kicked pretty well. And then I just continued in my junior and senior year. Let me ask you something then. I guess the soccer is the way you got the sidewinder style then, is from kicking a soccer ball side-footed. I believe so. I, I, I feel that the soccer gave me the fundamentals of, of how to kick soccer style. And uh, I just applied it to a football, kicking a football, and it's worked out so far for me. All right, now let me ask you something. A lot of people say, well, how can a guy so small kick the ball so far? But if you think back to all the great sidewinder style kickers in the, made, in the pros, the majority of them, and, he, and even the great sidewinders we've had here at Florida State, people like Frank Fontes and some of those, they all were small people. Uh, what is it about the sidewinder style? It, it, is it more muscle that's in the leg than, say, that straight-on style? Or is it the way you hit the ball? What, what do you attribute to the fact that you get your kickoffs generally five to ten yards deep in the end zone almost every time? Is, what is it? Is it a super powerful leg, or is it just the, the fundamentals? Well, so soccer style, you don't really have to be a big person. You, you have to be a pretty good athlete, and, and it's you use more of your leg than a straight-on kicker. And uh, I feel the reason why I, I get great distance on the ball is because, well, I've always, you know, done other sports when I was young. I was a, a track runner. I was a running back. And I have, I have pretty good speed. And uh, I, I feel strength in my leg and, and speed it has helped me to get good distance on the ball. Now, you played for a school in Hollywood, uh, Hollywood Chaminade, which is a very large, private, predominantly Catholic institution, right? Yes, sir. Who was your high school coach? Vince Sapone. Vince Sapone. Now, he's been there for many years, if I'm not mistaken, in, in that area. Uh -huh. uh, I think, was he at South Broward at one time before he got over to Chaminade, or is he, was he an assistant at Chaminade? I know the name because I'm from that area myself. But uh -huh. I, No, I, I think he's been with Chaminade for, you know, since uh, for quite a while. Yes, for a long time. All right, now, uh, you say, how did you happen to come to Florida State? In other words, uh, where did you first, uh, were you contacted by FSU, or did you contact them, or who was this, the, the coach that worked with you and got you to sign with FSU? Okay, my uh, coach that recruited <coughs> myself was uh, Coach George Henshaw, the you know, offensive coordinator, and uh, he he come down, he, he was like the way I kicked, and uh, I guess FSU did too, and so he was recruiting me and telling me about Florida State, and I, I come up to visit, and I had, I was thinking about other schools at the time also, but I, I just liked what, what was at Florida State, and uh, I thought I had a good opportunity to play football in my first year, and that's what I was looking for. And uh, I, I liked the coaches there, I liked the people that I met, I liked the surroundings, and everything just looked really, really good at the time, and it still does, and that's why I chose Florida State. Have your mom and dad been able to make it up to quite a few of the ball games and see you kick them? Oh yes, they, they made it up to. Uh, a lot of the ball games my first three years, and now, now recently they just moved here. So you know, over the years they come up every game. My my mom and dad they just love it up here so much that they didn't want to leave. And, and and my dad, he scouts for the California Angels, and he's doing Northern Florida, and Georgia, and Alabama that this area. So that's why he moved up here. So sports has been in the in your family background all your life, then. Yes, that, all my life. In fact, speaking of your family being up here, you have a. Uh, brother that plays football at Leon High School, and uh, I wanted to ask you this: How does it feel to have a brother playing for a team that's ranked higher than the Seminoles? <laughs> <laughs> really, the, the Leon Lions are, are ranked you know, first in the state and uh, Class 3A. Class 3A, and uh, my my brother is on the team. He, he's a defensive end. His name's Vince, and uh, the thing about it is uh, he's he's all, he just turned 16 years old, and he's six foot one, and and I'm his older brother. I'm five years a senior, and uh, He's a lot taller than me. <laughs> yeah, but but you've got the big leg. <laughs> yeah. Now, uh, Vince, of course, like you say, is uh, you were telling me he's a great baseball player, and you're hoping that that'll be his claim someday to possibly a college scholarship. And I think Mike Martin and the Seminoles would probably be looking at him pretty strong the next two years at Leon High School. Uh, it's got to be great to be in a program like Leon because they're not just a super football team. They have a good, well-balanced program and a super athletic director in Gene Cox. But Let's get back to you and about the Seminoles. Now, this past week, you had uh, one of your better games. Not, not, not your best. I'd say the game two weeks ago had to be your, your best, probably. The Nebraska win just had to, has to stick out really in your mind, doesn't it? Oh, it does. It was such an important game for us, and uh, 
I'm just glad I was able to contribute, you know, uh -huh. to to the win and get some points on the board and uh, it was just the greatest win I've ever been associated with and I just I'll never forget that game. Now let me ask you another question. You, um, of course, you work with Kurt Unglob as your holder right now and uh, I guess he's been the holder all year, hasn't he? He sure has. Now, how important is the holder to the kicker in your opinion? Now I'm not taking away from Kurt, but you know, just well, about three or four weeks ago, the University of Florida plays kicker missed four field goals in one game. Mm -hmm. And 90% of what came out in the paper was that it was because he had a new holder and it, the timing was off and this and that. But you and I were talking earlier and you said that the holder is important, but by the same token, that it's concentration and confidence and things like that. Now, he came back and kicked five against Ole Miss this past weekend. In fact, that game's going to follow this game on TV, the Ole Miss Florida game. So uh, you Gator fans out there, be sure and watch your Gator offense put the ball in the end zone. Uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say that, should I? Our <laughs> offense didn't exactly put the ball in the end zone too much this past weekend, but uh, thank God the defense put 29 points on the board. But getting back to, to how important do you feel that place kicker is? I mean, mean the holder, the hold pardon me. The holder, you know, is, along with the center, they're very important because in, in practice, you, every day you're getting your timing down with them. and. Uh, you know, and every every kicker has their their favorite holder and their favorite center. But if something happens to them, you you can't worry about it. You you have to concentrate and you have to go on and and you have to just worry about when just concentrate on the ball being put on the ground and, and you go from there. But uh, the important the holder is very important. But uh, if something goes wrong there, you have to just you know concentrate and go with the, the next holder. Right. Now I'm not trying to throw off on anybody, but it seems to me the last, well, last week especially, it seemed like we had more off-the-mark snaps than we had had in other games. We had a couple of high snaps, and then we had one that rolled back, and, uh, you know, everybody's due a bad game, and I guess our center to, uh, snapper on that just had an, a little bit of an off day, but it, it was very important, I thought, that Unglob twice was able to grab a very high snap and get it down the tee. Now, if that ball's not on the tee when you come through, there's no way you're going to oh, make yeah. it, is there? No. See, the, you know, Trent Barnes, our center, you know, he, he's just, he's a great center. He, he's cool out there, he, he's cool and calm. He knows what he's got to do. Kurt Unglob, the reason why I chose him for my uh, holders, because, you know, he's a great receiver. He's got the you know, greatest hands I, I've ever seen. And I just know that if, if a snap is bad, and, and there's, it's in an area where Kirk can reach it, he's going to get it and he's going to put it down for me. But I'm not taking anything away from the center. It's just the fact, like, this year I've kicked a lot of time, went out for a lot of field goals. I didn't even expect to go out this many times, for you know, for 18 field goals. But the more you go out, you know, the more chances there are of, you know, a, a snap going a little right. little high on the ground. But I don't worry about it, you know, because Kurt's there and Trent's doing his best. Everybody's doing their best. They're not there to screw up. That's right. Well, I was just going to say, you know, uh, they talk about on Mondays a lot of times you're reading the paper about which players graded out the best on their job and how many, you know, like 80% or more is considered excellent. Well, Trent Barnes snapped the ball five times for field goals the other night and, what, three more times uh -huh. on plate on extra points. Plus punting. All right, so there you, you sit there and you say, well, the guy had, had what, one, two or three bad snaps out of about 12. Mm -hmm. So he graded out about 80%. On his snaps, so he certainly had a what, what you'd call a, an above-average oh, ball yeah. game. Like you say, it's just the number of snaps is bound to catch up with you. He had five perfect snaps the week before uh -huh. when you got. Didn't you get five in the game the week before? Yes. No, wait. Well, five. Who was he had five against? Uh, Pitt. Pittsburgh. Five. Five. Yes. Yeah, I guess it was. Well, now. <coughs> okay, five. No. Five against Pitt and four against Nebraska. Okay, but why did I think it was four against Pitt? <laughs> Weren't you 14 know. out of 16 going in? Came out 18 out of 20. I was 14 of, out of 16 oh, now, going in. You had it. five. You had five, but one of them was snapped on the ground. You never got to kick it. No, you actually, there was a, a. I thought it was four field goals I, and three extra points. No, against where? Against Pitt. That was our last game, wasn't it? No. Oh, that's right. Boston I've lost College. a game. <laughs> Boston College. You're right. Five against Pitt. Folks, don't mind me. I knew there was somebody I was forgetting. Boston College. Well, anyway. Okay, four against Nebraska, five against Pitt, and then four more uh -huh. against Boston College. So you're talking about 13 field goals in three ball games. 
And now you got a big game coming up this weekend with Memphis State. Now, when I say big game, it's big because it's worth $211,000 to us from a standpoint of uh, revenue from ABC. It's on regional TV. And, of course, um, you and I were talking, too. Now, do you think that our team is going to go into this game with a certain measure of overconfidence? It worries me an awful lot. I know I don't want to see us go out there with the attitude that we're going to just blow these guys right off the map just because they've only won one ball game and they've been unimpressive in their five losses. Do you think we're going to be able to go out there and keep our cool and, and beat these guys convincingly on, on regional TV? I believe so. But see, everybody, they, a lot of people worry about the Seminoles and winning the big games and then, you know, not getting, yeah, well, getting yeah. down for the, for the, they say, lesser games. But, uh, I mean, any college football team in the nation can beat you if you're, if you're down. So uh, none of these games are, are lesser than others. And, uh, if Seminoles won't be down, the game is on regional television, as everyone probably knows, and uh, that'll get us fired up right there. And the, the Seminoles will, will play ball at Memphis. Yeah, in fact, it's got to, if I was uh, Coach Williamson from Memphis State, the thing that would scare me the most is knowing that it's on television, that Ron Simmons has won the MVP award in something like five out of six television games in his career. And Simmons is just about due to have a spectacular game. Now, he's had some excellent games this year. Of course, he, he was hurt three games, and then he's had Miami. I thought he was just barely coming back. Then against Nebraska, I thought he played a, a real good game, and against Pitt, he was even better. And then against Boston College, he was as good as he's been all year. But I kind of think that Ron Simmons may just really shine in this Memphis State game. And, of course, I wouldn't be surprised to see Reggie Herring have a great game. And Porowski's going to be a little slowed by just from being out for two weeks, but Hester will have another good game, although sharing time with Porowski's going to cut down on which guy's going to get the most press, shall we say, and the most uh, acclaim. So I look for Simmons and Herring to have great defensive games, not to mention probably Monk Bonasort ought to pick off two or three because I understand the Memphis State quarterback should be a running back. They tell me that he's a super runner, but that he can't hit the broad side of a barn with his passing. I think he's hitting about 30% of his passes. But what what are you looking for from Memphis State? Are they supposed to be good at, at rushing the kicker? Have they had many blocks in their previous games? Or have they given up a lot of field goals? Or, you know, in other words, do you expect that you'll get several opportunities? Or you would figure we're going to put the ball in the end zone without having to rely on your place kicking? Or what? I, uh, I feel I'll get a, a few opportunities this week. I, um, I, I'm looking forward to the, the offense, you know, getting some touchdowns. Uh, but I'm also looking forward to going for that national record. You know, I'm, I'm chasing Matt Barr's record right now. I have uh, four games to, to get it and surpass it, and I want to do that. So I hope each game I, I at least get a, a couple of tries. All right, now you, speaking of records, you're 18 out of 20 right now. The national record is 22. Now, if, and I think it's rather logical to assume we will get a bowl bid this year, bowl games count in that record, do they not? I believe. I don't. I, I don't believe so. I think they, they take it. I think Barr, a couple of his 22 came in the Penn State, uh, one of the really bowl games that Penn State was in. And I think that I think that whether it's an 11 or 12 game season, I do believe it counts as far as what's considered a regular mm -hmm. season. Now, the only thing that might affect that is the fact that if you play in a New Year's Day bowl, it might be considered the following year. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I do think in a, in a collegiate season, I think that it, the bowl games count. We'll have to do some research on that because that would make a difference. Sure will. But I don't think we really have to worry. With with four games left, I would say that your chances of getting four field goals are excellent because you're averaging. We've played, what, six, seven games now, and you've got 18 field goals. So you're averaging better than two a game. So if you just get half your average and get one a game, you'll tie the record. If you get one more than half, you'll break the record. So I don't think we have to worry about that. That brings up another interesting point. Of course, it's looking a little far into the future, but uh, with the Gator place kicking ha kicker having hit five against, uh, Brian Clark is his name, by the way, against the Ole Miss Rebels, and you had five against Pittsburgh, I would imagine that the, one of the interesting matchups, shall we say, in the Gator Seminole game at the end of the season on the 24th, I believe it is, or the 26th, will be our place kicking against theirs. Are you looking forward to that challenge? Oh, I'm looking forward to that. I look forward to the challenge with every time I play. I, I go against their kicker, and uh, I just take it upon myself to, to try to do better than them. That's just what, how, what competition is. And Brian Clark's a, a great place kicker over there in Florida, and uh, I'm looking forward to kicking against him, and uh, we'll see what happens when the game comes around. Well, let me ask you another question. Um, is it true that Coach Kish has been visiting with you regularly since last week's game to try to get you to 
play some running back for him, or is that just a rumor? <laughs> no, just a rumor. You know, <laughs> you know, I uh, there was a bad snap last week in one of the field goal attempts, and uh, it, it bounced over Kurt Ungloves hands and into mine, and I ran it around in. And uh, I, I was a running back in high school, and I, I just enjoyed getting the ball and, and turning up field, and I, I tried my best, and I, you know, I, I got out of bounds, fortunately. Well, I, I was going to say, I saw in the replays, you carried two or three Boston College men with you, though. <laughs> I mean, for a little guy, 100 and what, 175 pounds, you, uh, you ran with a lot of authority. And, of course, coming off the field, you looked pretty fired up. I mean... Aren't you ready to get out there and return some kicks? No, no. No, you don't want to take McKinnon's place. No, huh? no. I get, I get pretty, I get pretty fired up when I'm out there. That's how I play, and uh, you know, I enjoy the game. I, I get really enthused out there, and you know, when something like that happens, you know, I've got to do something. Either throw the ball, kick it out of bounds, and run it. And I prefer to run it. I want to ask you another question now, not to give it away to our fans, but I don't think there'll be too many scouts from opposing teams watching this show. Have we got any plays? Uh, now, when I say a fake field goal, for example, all right, Unglob's a wide receiver. And you're a kicker, of course. Now, a lot of times teams have their quarterback hold on snaps, and Stockstill, I believe, did the holding last year, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, is there a play where Kurt will come up and throw the ball, or is there a play where you'll throw the ball, for example, or, or are we pretty much uh, just sticking to if you, you, you just, I guess, if the ball's a bad snap, you're... Your option is, like you say, either run it or throw it. Do you have an out, a safety outlet, somebody that goes out on a, for a pass? Well, or what? okay, well, you know, I'd probably be lying if I, I said that we didn't have, you know, fake field goal play. Every team does. Just don't but, give it away. No, <laughs> I mean, we're, uh, you know, we're doing well. We're hitting the field goals, and we're, right now we don't need to, to fake it. Maybe we would, but, yeah. it, you know, use what we have is uh, if, if a snap is messed up, like the other night, and, uh, you know, if it gets bobbled around back there, Kurt and I are supposed to yell fire, you know, if I can't get the kickoff. And, uh, you know, I, it's, it's supposedly Kurt's supposed to get the ball when we yell fire, and he's supposed to just, like, roll out and, and throw, get, get it out of there. But the ball bounced in my hand, and we, we couldn't yell fire out there. Right. And, and well, Kurt, when that happened, Kurt was telling me, fall on the ball, Bill, you know, <laughs> fall on it. I, you know, I didn't, I just said, no way, you know, I'm running this. And, uh, but, you know, that's what we'll do if there's a bad snap, we'll just yell fire and just try to get it out in the flats. Right. All right, now let's talk a little bit about your kickoffs uh, as, or, and also your pro aspirations. Now, one thing, you know, I don't think that, I shouldn't say I don't think, but the number of field goals you've hit is very important, obviously, because it gets you up there in the national standings as far as scoring goes. they are got to be impressed with 18 out of 20 so far, and your only two misses were both long ones. One of them, I believe, was just shy. It was a 52-yarder. The other one was, uh, I think the ball was not, I don't even know if that ball had actually hit the tee yet when you kicked mm -hmm. it, had it? It was kind of about two inches off the tee, yeah, I think. because I, I got under it. I don't, I don't. But both of them would have made it had they had the distance because they were, they were straight at the field goal, uh, at the goal post. So that's got to impress people. But I think more impressive to pro scouts has got to be the consistency with which you're putting the ball in the end zone on your kickoffs. Now. What do you think is going to be the most important thing as far as you're getting an opportunity to pros? Do you feel that the, the place, the field goals are more important or the distance on the kickoffs, or you think it's 50-50 or what? You know, you've, you've got to be, without a doubt, the most consistent deep kicker in the college ranks I've ever seen. Well, thank you. I, I've worked hard at it. I, I feel that the, the pros, they look at it both. I don't, I don't know, kind of equally, but they look at, you know, of course, uh, percentage is real important to them. But they, the pros, I believe, like the strong leg, and and they, and all, all, field goal kicking is is just, you know, consistency, and, and that can be worked on. But the strong leg can't be worked on. You, you either have it or you don't. I mean, you can get uh, a few more yards on a ball, but you, you can't get 10 or you can't get 15. And uh, I feel they look at the strong leg and the, the percentage of uh, kicking. You know the field goals that that will come about by practice. Right, now, what effect is it going to have on you when you get in the pros and you're not allowed to use a tee to kick off? Of? What effect is that going to have on you as far as field goals and extra points? It has no effect on me because I uh, I've done it before in practice. I, I th just throw the block away and, and I kick off the ground and I have no problem with it. It's just a little more concentration, keeping your head down, and uh, it's all right up here in your head. Now, when you kick, do you use a flat-soled shoe so that you don't catch your cleats in the turf? No, I, I use regular cleats. Regular cleats. Yeah. Now, how, how do you do that, though? I mean, I would think that those cleats extending down below the bottom of the foot would tend to make it dig into the turf or into the tee. What, what, 
how does it, you know, are you hitting it that high okay, that well, it doesn't come into play? Okay, well, uh, you know, of course, in college, you know, I'm, I'm kicking off a block, so, you know, it's raised up off the ground a little bit, so the cleats don't come into play or don't come into contact with the ground. Right. But now, when you get in the pros, you know, they little tricks here and there, like they file off their cleats and the things like that, and so they won't have contact in the ground. But I see. I'm not in the pros right now. I'm in college, and... I'm doing my barefoot thing. kickers are allowed in the pros now, right? Oh, yes, Tony Franklin are. from uh -huh. Philadelphia kicks barefoot and things like that. Now, at one time, I believe the pros had a rule that you couldn't kick barefoot, or maybe it was the college ranks, but uh, I can't. The colleges allow barefoot kicking. Oh yes, because Tony Franklin kicked in college barefoot, yeah. and they've got a one of them did have a rule, but I think they changed it. But anyway, now getting back to uh, you know, like you say, a strong leg. A good example of that would have to be the Erksleben guy from Texas that went on to the New Orleans Saints. Now, here's the guy that's got an unbelievably strong leg. He's a super punter as well as place kicker, but he's had a terrible time at New Orleans with his accuracy. But they're still hanging on to him, and of course they had Gary Premium there for a while, and now they've got somebody else doing their place kicking for him. And of course uh, the little guy that was at Arkansas and was with St. Louis, now he just recently had a real tragedy. He was cut from the St. Louis Cardinals the day after he was beat out by Neil O'Donohue, who used to cook for the Bucks. But he was another one with a strong leg that had trouble with accuracy. Are you, you're not worried about your accuracy at all. Oh, no. You? I'm proving my accuracy this season. I'm not worried about it at all. Yeah. So that's, you know. Have you had any feelers from pro teams? Are they allowed to contact you, or do they send you questionnaires yeah. to ask you if you're interested? I just get, you know, questionnaires from them. That's about it. Mm -hmm. I've got some. One nice thing about being a kicker, you don't have to worry about what you're timing in the 40-yard dash and things like that, I don't guess. That's true. You don't have to worry about it, but it's important to me, and I try to keep up with my speed to so go along. It helps my kicking, and that's really important to myself. What is your speed in the 40? I run a 4.6 and a 40. That's very fast. So that's why you look so quick going around the end there, huh? Well, now, what, what, you know, what are your long-range goals? Obviously, you probably want to play football uh, in the pros. What are you majoring in the college? Criminology. Another criminology major. Well, <laughs> Borowski was a criminology major, too. Now, uh, would you like to someday, if you didn't make it, say, in the pros, or if, if you played five or six or ten years and then decided to hang it up, what's your, what, what's your goal there? Do you want to be an investigator for, like, the FBI? Or do you want to work in inside type criminology or in I'd like what, to what be type? an investigator. That sounds interesting to me and uh, I, I just like that kind of field. That criminology field has been great for FSU. I know <laughs> Dave Callens, the great one for the Boston Celtics, was a criminology major and of course Borowski and yourself and I think there are several other criminology majors. Now a lot of people tend to think that criminology therefore must be a real easy crib course. That's not true oh, at all, no, is it? Not true at all. You know, you, you've got to go in there, you've got to study and you got to work at it. Nothing's easy when it comes to school. Well, that's that's good. What kind of grade average are you carrying, Bill? You've got a 2.5 right now. Well, that's uh, doggone good. That's just uh, in halfway in between a B and a C, and that's plenty good to stay in school and get out and get a, you know, go on. All right, well, let's see. I'm trying to think what else we might want to talk about. The Seminoles, of course, of, uh, well, let's talk a little bit about your buddy, Ron Stark. Now, Ron's got himself a great uh, season going and punting. Uh, what happened the other night? Did you think that uh, he just down a little bit, or was it uh, the air was heavy, or what? It didn't seem that he really was fired up for the Boston College game. I'll tell you what I think happened. I just think the fact that Ron's human, <laughs> and uh, you know, it's, 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 just, it's, it's just you know, maybe we all have bad games. He, and he really didn't have a bad game. Not he, a bad game. I mean, no, he, he averaged him. thirty-eight. <laughs> he averaged thirty-eight yards. Well, the way he's been kicking right. this year, phenomenal. Uh, they said it's a bad game for him. Right. Ron's a, a great athlete, and uh, it, to me, it wasn't a bad game. He knows it wasn't that bad. He's still second in the nation, and Ron will be back. Well, he did hold second in the nation. Oh, yeah, he's still. By the way, I might mention the people out there that right now you're ranked second in the nation in scoring behind the running back for Southern Mississippi, who's leading the nation. And this ought to be your week to catch him. Now, how far behind him are you? Two points. He's got 79, you've got uh, 77. 77. But he's got to face the Alabama Crimson Tide this weekend, so he could be hard-pressed to get many points on the board. And you're going to be out there facing Memphis State, so hopefully we'll see you move into number one in the nation in, in scoring. Hopefully. Bill, I appreciate your being on the I show, do, and I just want to tell you people out there, we've had another outstanding guest. And tune in next week for another show. And remember, keep your kids off the street. Send them to athletic events. Let them go see the Leon Lions play somebody or the Godby Cougars or any, anybody. Support your local high schools. Support your colleges. And remember, athletes, athletics, keep kids off the street and out of trouble. Thank you much for tuning in. We'll see you next week.